Now, you also, just thinking about the uh, polio vaccine and, and uh, the, the things that were happening at that time, there also was a case that you, you had of uh, uh, a patient who, uh, uh, her child was immunized, I believe. How do you know all this stuff? I That's truly your, terrific. <laughs> terrific. I, I listened to you talk. <laughs> See, we, yeah, we do. We, so we began immunizing people, and um, suddenly, uh, uh, during this process, a woman came down with, by, uh, it was hospitalized at Worcester City Hospital, and I was consulted in uh, the way Dr. Bernie Stone was her, her neurosurgeon, and I said, what's going on here? I examined the lady, and I said, this uh, symptomatology is consistent with poliomyelitis. And we took the necessary specimens to diagnose poliomyelitis serologically and the virus. And indeed, she was infected with poliomyelitis, and the source of that virus was her infant son, because the poliovirus was administered orally, and it uh, 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 got it, uh, its entry into the system through the gastrointestinal system, and. The, uh, I asked her about the, the child, the, the newborn, and, and indeed uh, uh, she was diapering, changing diapers, and this child uh, had the virus isolated from his or her stool. Yeah. And, uh, and it was active virus. It was an active, it was a live, it was, it was called live oral poliovirus vaccine. Yeah. And that's what we were giving. So that immediately was brought to the attention of the medical world. I think uh, probably an article in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was uh, published uh, promptly. And the recommendation was that you have to investigate the parent. And if they have not been immunized for poliovirus, you should immunize them first mm -hmm. and the child afterwards, rather than the child, which is a, a bundle of feces and live oral polio virus. <laughs> <laughs> a great source of becoming yeah. infected. So okay. that's what we did. It, was, yeah, it, worked, it worked out well. So that was, uh, that was a very interesting case, uh, dealing with the uh, polio virus. But also you've had some other interesting public health cases that you involved yourself with before you were commissioner of public health when you were just uh, practicing your internal medicine. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm thinking of, of one involving uh, uh, the cafeteria at Memorial Hospital. <laughs> um, tell me about that one. Yeah, that was... Um That was, uh, I think it was Salmonella broccoli. Was that right? The, the bacteria Salmonella broccoli uh, at the Memorial Hospital in Worcester, and we, we investigated that. And I think there were a number, maybe seven people, seven isolates of Salmonella broccoli in the bacteriology lab. Wow, I mean, to, even to isolate one person with salmonella broccoli is significant. Here are seven. So we uh, were called. Thank you for reminding me all this past. It was really terrific. We went in, and we decided that we would we would do rectal swab cultures on as many people as he could, from uh, the nurses, the patients, the doctors, and we did that. And the fewest number of cases we found 
per possible employee was in the maintenance staff and salmonella blockley is uh, in, an oral infection a gastrointestinal infection by ingesting the bacteria in the fewest number of uh, people of the of the hospital employees to be infected were the uh, maintenance staff and we did dietary histories and we found that the maintenance staff usually brought their lunch to the to the uh, hospital and ate their lunch. They didn't necessarily eat in the cafeteria. They carried their lunch. And then we went to the kitchen and isolated salmonella, broccoli, and ice cream that the hospital was making. And they were using uh, fresh, unpasteurized eggs, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, which was, was the source of the salmonella broccoli. And we ended up with, I don't know, over 170 people that were in, had been infected. We followed them through. It was so quite a path. Yeah. You went from uh, noticing uh, increased isolates of a particular bacteria, of, of performing uh, cultures on staff of the entire hospital, of tracking it uh, by dietary history, and finding the source being the cafeteria, and within the cafeteria being their homemade ice cream, and, and within that the eggs that they were using. Well, they made their homemade ice cream. The homemade ice cream was made and fortified with fresh eggs. Yeah. They weren't pasteurized. Yeah. So the, the fresh eggs, you just put them in there and mix them around. It's like eating more eggs. Yeah. You know, when you eat an egg, you cook it. But every egg is a, a raw egg is a potential source of salmonella bacteria because the salmonella is part of the intestinal flora of the chickens. Right. So now then there is the issue of uh, the Holy Cross football team. Oh, yes. Yeah. Tell me about that. That's coming coming on, uh, I know it's 48 years ago, mm -hmm. because our youngest child, Elizabeth, was, was born just at that time, and I disappeared from my wife alleges I was up at the Holy Cross College campus and uh, studying the uh, an outbreak of uh, hep, hep, uh, hepatitis. The Holy Cross football team. 1969. Yep. They met with me on the Sunday after their Dartmouth game, which was the second game of the season. And the, the, the players were complaining of, uh, quote, rubber legs. They, they felt weak. And I, I noticed that you know, three, four, five, or six of them were jaundiced. I said, wow. I mean, at that time, the transmission of hepatitis A virus was eating raw clams. Well, football players don't eat raw clams. Not one, not a team. We bled the entire team and we found that 90 out of 96 players had hepatitis. And that's unusual. Some were jaundiced. Uh, the bulk of them were not jaundiced, but had enzyme liver enzymes. Mm -hmm. We bled them all, and uh, 90 uh, had a liver enzyme SGOT, SG, over a, over 100. Mm -hmm. 
that was the, that was the diagnosis, and uh, we had to recommend that these players stop playing. Right. And it was the first time in collegiate football that the season schedule had to be canceled. Yep. The entire the entire season, right? Uh -huh. The entire season had to be canceled. And in, uh, incidentally, the next time that happened was in 1970, when Marshall University's football team died in a plane crash in West Virginia. So so awful. Well, to return to. Uh, Holy Cross College, and how do these? And the, oh, and there was a lot of hepatitis A in the Worcester community, and for them all to become so many to become infected, there had to be something common, a common denominator. It was the end of August. They were playing in the heat, and they were drinking a lot of water. The water supply to the practice field at Holy Cross College comes in on Dutton Street. The, the public water supply ends at Dutton Street, then the Holy Cross has its uh, 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 delivery of the water, and the water comes in a pipeline that is interrupted by five underground faucets. The last one from which they, which was in the field house, as the field sloped down the hill, the, from which they obtained the water, uh, was the source of the drinking water for the football team. So we checked, we checked the, uh, uh, the, the weather conditions, they were hot in the 80s and and we took the water pressure. And if, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. They all had hepatitis A. And they just could, they just could not play football. That canceled the football schedule. And, uh, That was the end of the football season for, for the uh, college. Mm -hmm. So, it, so it, there was this uphill water feed, and there were was it connected to the sprinkler system for the the field? Well, or they there was did. Some? Uh, these underground faucets all uh, had faucets that you could open a, a loosely covered wooden cover and attach a sprinkler, and that was to keep the field green. Sure. And they, they did do that. But as, but any change in the water pressure right. would siphon water back into the system. So we opened a, a, a hydrant down this, at the beginning of Dutton Street, and it just siphons that water down. And we knew that the children in the neighborhood were all playing in those water pools. Wait, you can't have kids bathing in water that you're ultimately going to drink. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what was happening. And a lot of hepatitis A virus, and and uh, that's what what happened. Uh, we opened the hydrant down the street. You could siphon the water back in. We checked the fire records in the city, and there was a uh, there was a two alarm fire down at the base of the uh, hilltop because this is this is really 200 feet above the ground level. Right, There's only that, crosses on that, a hill. That football field, practice mm -hmm. field, and uh, they uh, they all became. Uh, Infected. That was that was uh, very unfortunate. But what we recognized too is that 
drinking water line has to be a dedicated water line. It cannot be interrupted. Right. So we changed public health law with that. Absolutely, you can't. And a dedicated line would go into the field and down to the faucet that's used for drinking. Mm -hmm. But you cannot have five interruptions along the way in any one of them. Could draw something in from yeah, the surroundings. And the, and the kids were playing there. Every yeah. night the kids would go into the field and it was hot and they'd, you yeah, know. things happened. Yeah. So that was yet another interesting little yeah. piece of detective work that you did during your career. Yeah, we, uh, that, that was uh, published. And yeah, the, the, I have said maybe mentioned it earlier that that was the end of the season for that yes. football yeah, game. Yeah, it was canceled for the whole season, right? First time that it happened. The, so, uh, the captain of that football team uh, was m m my son-in-law's football coach in high school. Right, right. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, Interesting connections. Yeah, uh, right. yeah. And speaking of hepatitis, you, you had another occasion to uh, find something with regard to uh, Delta agent. Oh, in the, the 1980s? The Delta, the Delta virus? Uh, tweaked me a little bit more. Okay. <laughs> Were you involved in, in uh, finding the Delta virus, the Delta agent for hepatitis uh, B during the 19, I believe it was the 1980s. I, th I was under the impression that that tracked Worcester. The Delta virus, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going back uh, 17, almost 40 years, mm. 37 years ago. Um, give me another little tweak, <laughs> <laughs> Well, we can, we can uh, come back to that. Uh, more interesting, though, is just, you know, the kind of practice that you had, particularly during the 60s and 70s. What sort of illnesses did you treat? Well, I treated a, a lot of infectious disease uh, problems, and and then I became focused on it <clears throat> because they're preventable, mm -hmm. and I was very interested in disease prevention and public health, and mm -hmm. that's what I ultimately changed my direction and stopped practice and went into public health mm -hmm. and then was uh, very honored to be the commissioner of public health for the city of Worcester mm -hmm. for many years. Right, for a decade. And the offices in, on Mead Street in Worcester, the, the Mead Street School, and mm -hmm. it was really, uh, to me, very important work. Yeah. And... Um, just a, a picture, perhaps, of a typical day in your internal medicine practice when you first started out. Uh, were you in solo practice? Uh, I, I was in solo practice. And, and the office was right across the street from Hanneman Hospital. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I... Uh, uh, I, I developed an association with colleagues, Robert Bissett, uh, mm -hmm. Richard Haas, who came from New York, and uh, Stanley Cocott, mm -hmm. uh, Jim Pease, and we, uh, we built a building at 200 Lincoln right. Street. Right. We, uh, we built a beautiful building there. And I, you know, I'm, I don't know anything about real estate, but the, the three decker that was right next to where we were located, the woman in that building who owned it was my patient, and then her family had to sell it, and we bought it, and we expanded it, and made a beautiful uh, series of office buildings on Lincoln Street in Worcester, right mm -hmm. up to St. Bernard's Church. And, and you know, on to uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, Hanneman Hospital. So mm -hmm. it was um, it was really good. I would, yeah. So um, just to to back up just a little bit, what first drew you into medicine as a career? Oh, I was uh, I was a pre dental student in college. I had an uncle who was a dentist, and my parents had no formal education. My brother uh, alleges that he was an MD. He was a meat distributor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a great guy. 